100 from top to bottom and you don't feel like one of the tracks feels like some record from a different era. You know, you don't feel like, right. oh, like this track that's coming behind this other track sounds like it's from 1925. There, there's right. still a contemporary conversation that all tracks coming out right now have. And so I'm always trying to think about, okay, well, what is my contribution to that? How am I interjecting? How am I in conversation with that? Yeah, totally. I mean, modern music has so much more bass. It's like, it's just like, you know, the, the, the frequency uh, spectrum is like, there's something there that you have to always be in tune with. That's true. Absolutely. And most of us really are using the um, same tools for the most part. We're all pretty much making tracks on the same type of computers, using a lot of the yeah. same type of DAWs, you know, so... Everyone's using the FabFilter Pro Q. Q. Exactly. <laughs> so there's all, already a standardization ha- process. There's a standardization process. But f- from within those limitations, how are you then expanding and being creative but still staying in step and in conversation with everything that's that's out there. Yeah. I think that's the challenge of modern production, especially. Do you do anything specific or do you have any like thought process behind how you structure and arrange your tracks in terms of like, you know, the different parts, how they interweave, that kind of stuff? That's a really good question. For me, it's all about the song. What is the song lending itself to? Sometimes the song needs a pre-chorus to just connect the chorus and the verse. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the track needs an outro to solidify and distill everything that the song was about and to properly end it. Sometimes a song can go out of the last chorus and just end abruptly. It, it, it just depends on the song and how the song I should say, and how the production is reinforcing the theme of the song. I'm always trying to take the listener on some type of journey. How are we going from beginning to middle to end? What's that trajectory sound like sonically? And thinking about an arrangement that works the best for that song. Yeah, totally. So you mentioned to me that you do a bunch of like co-writing sessions. Do you have any tips for, you know, getting in the studio with someone else and having like a prolific experience? It really all comes down to attitude. Stay positive. It's so easy for a session to go off the rails. I've I've been in some of those types of sessions, but everybody has to stay positive, has to stay positive, bring respect to the session and be open, be open to the other person's contributions. Don't be closed off to another person's contributions, but be open and be fair and always maintain an open sense of communication so that ideas flow easily and there's some sense of community that's being built. But your attitude is the most important thing, staying positive, staying positive for sure. Wow. Yeah, I love that. I feel like... It's so that, like we said, the communication thing is, is so important. It's so important to be open at every stage, really, of a production, I think. Like, you know, when you're, even when you're producing somebody, you know, and you're, and you're just the producer, you're not the, the songwriter. Being open about what you think about things and, and having that kind of dialogue at all times, I think, is, like, really the key to having something that's, that's fruitful. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Is there anything sp- that you do specifically in your productions that you think gives you a trademark sound? I think for me, <laughs> I've had people describe my production is there's always something quirky as 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 much as there's a standard drum sound and it's modern with respect to the sounds I'm using in the mix I always try to put something a little left of center in my tracks Mm -hmm. and how I use certain instruments how I filter certain sounds I'm always trying to think about what is going to give this track an edge, what is going to make it different than the 500 other tracks that are going to be popular or noticeable. What am I doing that's different? I like to use vocal samples. That's something that I'm very intrigued by. Typically, when I'm working with an artist, 
obviously there's going to be tons of outtake content. There's going to be so many leftover vocals that we don't use. And I typically will take those and build little synths. Mm. I'll overprocess them. I'll sample them, build whole new instruments with those vocal chops and vocal samples just to give some unique quality also to that artist, right? If you create an instrument out of the artist saying one note and then sample that in a polyphonic sampler to create more chords, to create pads, that's a sound you know nobody else is going to have. Nobody else is going to have that unique vocal pad sample chopped and affected. Nobody else is going to have it because nobody else has that artist. So that's something that I always usually end up doing towards the end. So I make the track, then you put the artist on the track, then I have all this additional content that I can go and go back and play with at the end, which is a bit of a post-production part for me that I think helps to create some unique sound. But I love playing with vocal samples. That's one of my favorite things to do, manipulating them and creating different sounds out of them. That's amazing. Do you, do you have like a specific tool that you're using to do this? Are you using like Melodyne and, and Contact? Like what, what are you doing? I mostly use Melodyne for vocal correction and, and pitch correction. It's such a powerful tool. Yeah. It's so powerful. It has, like a little, it has like a little synth section where you can kind of turn a vocal into a synth. Yeah, um, you, can, you yep. can get really interesting effects out of using Melodyne, but I don't use Melodyne for that reason. I like to use vocal synth a lot. I love mm. to use Serato cool. Sample. I like to use Effects Rack. Sound Toys can be really fun to use that, to slap that on a vocal track and play around with some of the effects that you can put together by com- combining individual effects processors yeah. and sound toys. That's a lot of fun. They're like the number one most praised bundle oh on, this, on this podcast. Everyone everyone uses it. You can be so production focused with those plugs because yeah. those plugs completely transform whatever you put them on to the point where you can Absolutely. create completely different Absolutely. instruments. It's, it's not just engineering. It's not just really an engineering Right, they're creative plug. tools. Can be very creative. Yeah. Yeah. Very creative tools. Nectar is cool too. I like Nectar yeah. by Isotope. Really cool vocal processing plugin. Cool. I, I have it. I think, but I, I should. I haven't used it, so I should. Maybe I'll check it out again. Ne- Nectar uh. is cool. Nectar is cool. You know, and also Trash by Isotope can be very cool yeah. to use on other types of sounds, but also on vocals. Love it. Um, do you have any templates that you're using when you're doing any of your productions? I have all types of templates. I have band templates. I've spent the last year and a half working with Mr. Wives. Their album is finally about to come out. So I have a whole Mr. Wives template. So when they come in the studio, I typically know we're going to do probably one of three different things. So I have templates, Pro Tools templates built out for that. I also have templates for some of the artists that I'm working with. Vocal templates, for sure. I have a track template that I built out in Ableton that has all of my favorite kicks and snares and hats. And it's it's already loaded up, so I don't have to go individually find all those samples. Also, I've customized Ableton to open at startup in a way where all my keys have been mapped accordingly, how, how I like them to be mapped. I did that because... I've been in Pro Tools for like seven years or so before I moved to Ableton. So I I changed some of the key commands to match my Pro Tools key commands in Ableton. Yeah, just that probably. stuff is just second nature, right? You can't. It's hard to shake that muscle memory. Yeah, but but I I st- I do know some quite a few of the Ableton specific key commands too that I never changed. But so are you using are you using both both the AWs now in tandem or are you have you made a complete switch to Ableton? I have to use Pro Tools because I, I record so many different types of things and it's our standard for work at Atlantic. Right. So I have to use there's no way around Pro Tools and I'm lightning fast in Pro Tools. I'm also lightning fast in Ableton, but I would never want to track a band in Ableton. And I don't typically like to do a lot of vocal heavy vocal tracking in Ableton because I'm so big on playlisting and Ableton doesn't quite have the playlisting functionality figured out. 
So yeah, playlisting when you're doing really huge vocal recording yeah. sessions, playlisting is so very critical. And even when recording bands, it's so important. So I haven't <clears throat> been able to completely abandon Pro Tools. And I don't know that I ever would because in my opinion, it's such a great tape machine. If you just need a program yeah. that's just great for recording, it's also great for mixing. Yeah, Ableton is fabulous because of all the creativity it affords you with re- with respect to loop-based production. If you do loop-based production, Ableton is really great for that and has two specific worlds you can work in. So there's session view and there's arrangement view, and you can really yeah. dial into both of those views so that you can create fast, efficiently, and you can arrange extremely fast in Ableton. So that's right. what I like. Arrangement and arranging in Pro Tools when it comes to track production, is not as f- fluent. It's, it's not as simple. And also... Yeah. I like how you said it before. It's like a tape machine, you know? It's a great tape Ableton, machine. Which, it's a great tape machine. Which is machine. like it's, created for that, you it's, know? It's, it's the greatest editing program we have. If you want to do fine, down to the millisecond editing with excellent precision and also with excellent resolution, I believe the Pro Tools is superior to most DAW out there. I use Logic mm-hmm. with the same amount of proficiency. I, I love Logic. I was I worked in Logic for 10 years before I moved over to Pro Tools. And I still do quite a bit of track production in Logic. But I've been splitting my time these days between Ableton and, and Pro Tools mostly. Are you able to mix in Ableton or do you do that in Pro Tools? I love to mix in Ableton, but you know what? I, I typically will dump everything in the Pro Tools because I like to get out of the environment in which I produce the track. Yeah, I totally and hear that. And just deal with the mixing portion. I also have a mix template that I built out in Pro Tools. So it's really cool and easy just to bounce all those stems out of Ableton and, and migrate the project to Pro Tools where I have all of my trinkets set up and where I've been mixing for 10 years. And so it's still kind of my go-to for mixing, to be honest. Nice. Do, do you mix the majority of the tracks you work on? I do. Or do you send some out? All of them. No. I don't know that I've ever not mixed a track that I worked on. Yeah, pretty much all of them. Nice. And, and do you have like a mastering engineer that you work with? I have a young woman out in Nashville who's done quite a few projects for me that I like to send work her way. But other than that, it's usually whoever the label picks. You know, the A&R team typically have their go-to folks. And, and I trust, I trust, I trust them. I'd like cool. to get to the point where I have my team and my people that I use almost for everything. I'm definitely still in search of that that mastering person. Right on. So, so we we all know that women are un- severely underrepresented in our field. What's been your experience working in music production as, and engineering as a woman? It's been fabulous because for me, I love that I get to bring all facets of myself to work. My perspective, my you know, 30 plus years of living as a woman, I get to bring all of that to work and I get to bring it to what I do creatively. And that matters to me and it means something to me. And I'm so grateful to be in this body and so grateful to be, have been born cis female and to have lived this life in this body. I'm so grateful for that. And I don't feel that it limits me in any way. Having said that, we do live in a sexist society in a sexist world that doesn't always view me like I view me. Right? I, I, lo- I love me. but And I think that there's nothing I can't achieve and nothing I can't accomplish. But, you know, there's still I'm still sharing this world with people who think completely in, in complete opposite terms. And so there's that having to manage how women are perceived with what I know to be true about myself and what I know to be true about other women, which is that we are dynamic and skilled in so many ways. I tell people all the time, if you can cook, you can make beats. I don't really see. Yeah. I don't, if you can cook a meal, you can definitely learn how to program tracks. Give me a break. Like it's not that difficult. So it's not rocket science. It's, it's really not. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's really not. So I I like to see more women involved, and it's why I have 
created a nonprofit called Gender Amplified, which I've been running since I was 19. It wow. actually.